All right, then we're ready for this uh, set of lightning talks. I'm on the lucky winner of the first session. Uh, so my name is Helge, and I'm going to talk about uh, some considerations for a large scale, low latency system. Um, the agenda is simply going through some experiences uh, that we've had here uh, developing this uh, system, which is used to power a number of uh, Microsoft systems, uh, only small pieces of those systems, but still uh, important pieces. Um, so I come from a Microsoft Development Center in Norway. Uh, we used to be a company called Fast Search and Transfer, and uh, we have been developing the solution that I'm talking to you about today. Um, so first off, uh, let's start with a question. Uh, what do you do when your system is slow? Um, well, I already heard another lightning talk today, uh, which was excellent on uh, a website for a jewelry store. Uh, and now uh, that, that was an awesome uh, way of fixing the system in uh, just a couple of hours. Uh, but now we're talking a bit more long term uh, slowness. Uh, so uh, first of all, well, you could do as Han Solo did in Star Wars a number of times. He just said, it's not my fault. Well, uh maybe you can even blame it on the speed of light because if you look at it uh how fast can information possibly travel around the globe uh actually uh speed of light is pretty fast but it's not that fast so if you need to move a single bit of information from one side of the earth to the other and back uh, that's going to take you more than 200 milliseconds um so that itself is a, re a reason to keep the data close and uh, typically when we create a, a large-scale system we have to relate to uh, uh, where the customers are so keep the data close to where the customers are that's a good guiding principle uh, however uh, you also need to take into account uh, any laws regulations or customer promises that you've made so, for example, if a customer says they want their data to be in Europe, even though they're, they don't happen to be in Europe, you have to keep the data there. And in that case, you can't just move the data to where the customer is. But in general, keep the data close to the customer. Uh, there are some complications, though, because usually one customer is uh, in a single region. Sometimes customers are spread across regions, and then you need to deal with multinational corporations. But let's assume uh, right now we can keep the customer in a single region. Then, if we look at, um, let's see if I can move to the next slide. Uh, if we look at one region, for example, North America, uh, there are quite big distances even within that region. Uh, from Boston to San Francisco, there are uh, 5,000 kilometers, and that's uh, 50 hours by car. Uh, if you go by the speed of light, uh, back and forth, it's going to be about 25 milliseconds. Uh, and that's maybe more than you want to add as unnecessary latency. So if all your customers are in the Boston area, you should make sure your data center is there and not in San Francisco. Uh, or what you also can do is you can geo-replicate inside the region. So you can use multiple data centers in the same region uh, with the same data. And that's what we've been doing. We've been setting up two to three data centers in every region, and that way uh, we don't have uh, all of that additional latency. In fact, that latency from uh, with difference between Boston and San Francisco in practice can be much more than speed of light because there are things happening on the way. There are switches, there are lots of things happening. So if you manage to keep the data as close to the customer as possible, you should do that. And then you can use uh, Azure Traffic Manager or something similar to make sure that you actually route to whatever data center at any time uh, gives you the best uh, performance. Um, so these are some ideas that uh, we've been playing with and we've seen a huge effect uh, when we've done so. Uh, but let's also look at some, uh, some more details. Um, one thing that we've found is that TCP is a slow starter. There's something called a TCP congestion window uh that's configured independently on server and client side and basically what this window is is it's the number of frames you can send until the server side will wait for an act from the client and that actually means one back and uh, back and forth round trip uh so if this window is small you're not going to be able to send your entire payload uh with in one go 
and that basically doubles the latency uh, and that's going to make your users angry because things are slow sluggish and they hate it so make sure you uh, configure the tcp congestion window properly however uh, you can't really configure it to anything you want it needs a warm-up so uh, we've been adding warm-ups and making sure we reuse connections the same applies to ssl handshakes uh, they are also slow so we want to have warm connections uh just be aware of one thing uh if you have uh, uh, these kind of warm-up calls pings or whatever uh they will steal connections from your real traffic so make sure you don't slow yourself down by taking over your own hot connections for useless work in the future there are other protocols coming up like quick uh, or a combination of various new uh, versions of tcp and tls and so on can allow you to configure some of this but anyway, watch out for uh, these challenges. Um, when you transfer data itself, uh, you should remember that uh, even though XML and JSON are really cool formats, they're wonderful, they can be parsed by any language, uh, they're pretty bloated. Uh, do you really need your data contract to be that flexible? Uh, is it enough with worsening, perhaps? Uh, there are uh, compact binary formats such as bond or protocol buffers that really transfers data in a much more compact format. And if you add compression on top, that also helps for binary formats, by the way, uh, you're suddenly shrinking the amount of data you need to send significantly. Uh, in addition to that, you should optimize your payload to begin with. Don't waste time by sending long strings. It sounds like maybe a micro optimization, but if you can squeeze into fewer frames uh, when you send data across, it's going to have a huge impact on the latencies that some of your users see. And of course, measure. Measure the actual payloads in bytes, measure the latencies and experiment a bit. Another thing, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about locks and transactions. Um, so I used to really love transactions, uh, but what sort of isolation level do you really need? Uh, do you even need transactions? Could you be uh, configuring your system in such a way that uh, your reads are waiting before, because one single write can hold up a number of reads, that's gonna slow everything down. So uh, be aware of this. Uh, we've optimized for uh, reads by having lock-free data structures. We use optimistic concurrency control when we write and we have a single writer. That avoids a lot of problems. Uh, there's actually a session at NDC on Thursday about uh, ACID and transactions. Uh, it's at 420 by Matthew Gross. You might want to go and check that out. He spends an whole hour on acid and transactions. I'm not sure there's a lot more detail there than what I can mention here in 30 seconds. Um, what we also seen is federation is really slow. So uh, if you make a call that fans out to multiple servers, that slowest server is going to be slower than you think just statistically. Uh, we've had cases where we need to fan out to 40 machines to get the data. And that will typically take a few seconds to get all the data back just because of variance. Uh, if we can put all the data on a single machine, uh, it's going to be so much faster, even at, uh, especially at the higher percentiles, like the 99th percentile, meaning 99% of your users will see a performance quicker than a certain time. And uh, if you can put all the data on a single machine, you can do it so much faster. You can do it in uh, fractions of a second. So uh, that's another word of advice, keep data together. And then there is this technique called hedging. Because there is a large variability in response times, something, sometimes things will just be slow. So what you can do is you can fire off another request if the first one is slow. And Google used this in their big table implementation where they managed to get their 99.9 .9 percentile down from 1800 milliseconds to 74 milliseconds by issuing 2% additional queries. So by just adding 2% more queries when things were going slow, they would really, really improve on their uh, user experience. So that's something to consider. Um, finally, another uh, Star Wars quote here, mind tricks don't work on me. Well, maybe they work on your users. Uh, don't forget the basics. Uh, everything doesn't have to be lightning fast. You can add progress bars. You can load data in the background. You can even do things like uh, loading all the uh, click targets in the background. Uh, so the summary is just a uh, list of uh, what I mentioned. Uh, have to take distance into account. You should keep things warm. You should avoid locking. Keep your data together. 
Uh, and then as a final word of advice, there's no such thing as luck in this game. Uh, you just have to measure, change, and repeat. And that's all I had. Thank you. <laughs>